haven't pressed record. So I'm going to do that now. So my apologies, those of you listening to the recording that you have missed the introduction um, for Indian Ed for All. However, we're only halfway through. So I'd also like to give a land acknowledgement. So in the spirit of healing, I acknowledge and honor the original peoples of the Southwestern Montana, Helena, Montana area, the Salish, Blackfeet, Kootenai, and other tribal nations, Crow, Northern Cheyenne, Chippewa Cree, Nez Perce, Nakoda, Dakota, Little Shell, Assiniboine, Shoshone, so many indigenous people who call it home, past, present, present and future. Uh, again, please sign into the chat um, if you would like us to, to know who you are and where you are. And if you would like renewal units, please do make sure to sign in on the sign-in sheet. The link should be in the chat by now. The sign-in sheet is only available until the last 30 minutes, so please do make sure to, to sign in. That is for our accreditation process. Um, so let's see the feedback survey. There is a feedback survey and that will open up the last 15 minutes. Please make sure to complete that uh, before uh, tomorrow afternoon as I do close that after 24 hours. Uh, the feedback survey is not just for renewal units. You do, it is required for renewal units. However, anybody is welcome to fill out the feedback survey and it's so valuable to us. We take all of those comments to heart and we try to um, improve which each session and each of the presenters that I've worked with have been so wonderful about um, trying to adjust and adapt according to your feedback. So at that point, at this point in time, I would love to introduce um, our presenters this evening. First up is Annie Sorrell, who is Bitterroot Salish and Ms. Pierce. She earned a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science from Haskell Indian Nations University and is currently working on a Master of Science in Conservation Biology from SUNY in New York. She recently accepted a post with the United States Fish and Wildlife Service as the Jackson Hole and Greater Yellowstone Visitor Center Manager at the National Elk Refuge. If you're ever in Jackson, do stop by the VC and say howdy to Annie. It's a really beautiful place. Annie works uh, with our other presenter tonight, Roger Fixico. He has earned a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science and Associate's Degree in Forestry and a certification in Geospatial a science from Salish Kootenai College. Ludge is also currently working on setting up uh, the Indian Science Show podcast as a business entity here in Montana, and I provided some links on the resource sheet. He's interested in the practical benefits that ethnobotany can bring to the ethics philosophy of how ecological restoration projects are planned and managed, and I can't wait to hear what you have to say tonight. Thank you for being here. Well, thanks for having us. I have to admit this is the first time Annie and I have done this kind of a presentation in this format. So bear with us as we adjust to some of the new technological challenges that we're learning about. So welcome and thank you for uh, joining us today. We're really grateful to be here. And we both find this subject very important and it has very deep meanings for both of us, but in very fairly different ways. And we'll get more to that as we get into the presentation. Today, we would like to go into the definitions of ethnobotany and how that has all everything to do with responsibility. And we really want to introduce people to this really cool word. And it's one of my favorite words that I didn't even know about until Annie showed me called biophilia or the love of life. And we felt the most accurate and way we could do this and to be as specific as possible would be to share it in a story about how Annie and I both grew up on the reservation, but we learned a lot about this place and our family and the people here by learning more about the plants themselves. And a lot of what we have gathered into this presentation and also a lot of what informs what we talk about is the conversations that we've had on our show, the Indian Science Show, which is a podcast that we started a few years ago. And this quote really captures a lot of the essence of what how we approach this subject is that although science is amazing and we both value it as one of the most important and powerful tools in our lives, but our approach is that we're more interested in understanding science. How does it work? 
what's the history of it, the philosophy of it, and how does it get implemented, and what are the effects of it and implications for Native people in the United States, but also internationally. And my name is Lucha Fixico. I wanted to show folks a little bit where I'm coming from. These are some of my kids and my grandma and my aunties, my, my mom. And I also have other relatives there that I've met through the years. These are some of my plant friends that I've met. And ever since I was a little boy, I remember just meeting specific plants in specific places and remembering them years and years later. And it's not always a single plant. Sometimes it's a community of plants. And I was always taught since I was a little boy by people like my mom, my grandma, my uncles, and my cousins. And also just spending time alone in the forest. I have, I've always learned and I've always been taught that these are our relatives and we have a responsibility to take care of them. That is not just some kind of a thing that is, it's not a weight that you have to bear. It's something that you hold and you carry it with you because it gives you strength and it gives you purpose. And so in that way, I've always had a sense of my own purpose and my own identity as a Pekani man, as a Blackfeet man or a warrior person that you have a responsibility to your elders that includes the plants, that includes the land, the water, and even my grandmas, who were the ones that taught me all this stuff when I was a little boy, just walking out in the foot forest with them, getting service berries and talking about random stuff that little kids ask their grandmas. And with that being said, I don't want to go too far into my story. It's a little too crazy for that. Uh, Annie is going to go ahead and introduce herself next, and then we will go ahead and tell you guys all about Ethnobotany. Yeah, so like was mentioned before, my name is Annie Sorrell. Um, I love the fact that we have two very different stories. Um, as Lija had mentioned, he had kind of a very deep history, starting when he was young now to where he is now. And me, I really didn't start my plant journey or my own cultural identity journey until I was in my early 20s to mid 20s. Um, it really was a new adventure for me to kind of get into this idea of how plants can truly affect your life in so many different ways. Uh, we were both born and raised on the Flathead Reservation. Um, which just kind of tells you how different our lifestyles have been. Uh, we pretty much lived within 1.2 million acres and we never met each other until we moved across the country to New York where we started our master's program. And it truly was the best thing that has happened to me. Um, the podcast itself, we really focus on how to be scientists and not only that, but to have multiple worldviews with science. Uh, my family, as you could picture, as is pictured here, uh, really kind of instilled the idea of education into me. So I focused a lot more of natural sciences uh, when I was in my undergrad. And then I had a couple issues that happened with me in my 20s that really made me focus back onto my own cultural identity and finding who I was. And it really helped me out because now I have about 19 nieces and nephews and nothing makes me prouder than being an ant and really helping guide them when it comes to harvesting, when it comes to connecting with land and when it comes to connecting with your culture in a completely different way. And this idea of ethnobotany and responsibility and even biophilia, I spend a lot of my time working with non-Indigenous people and trying to find common grounds on moving forward with having Indigenous values in conservation and also restoration efforts. And so now we're gonna jump into our webinar for the next hour. Um, I really hope that it is something that you guys enjoy this, like Ledger had said, this is kind of new, it's a new setup for us and also a new way to present these ideas that we've been working on, especially for the last few years. Yes, and just briefly, we, we wanted to give you a little bit of an idea of what we're gonna be talking about, some of the big pictures. So we're gonna define ethnobotany, biophilia, and indigenous. And we thought it was really important to define ethnobotany 
in a particular way, and we are defining it in a particular way. Although we base it off of certain definitions, we felt they were missing something. And biophilia is this word that just rolls off your tongue. And it also captures this notion of how humans don't just really, they don't, don't just have a desire to be in nature, to have some kind of quiet places by water or in the mountains or even in a park somewhere, but this is actually a biological need for us. And then indigenous is something we look at through a lot of um, international lenses as far as we like to talk about indigenous issues in the United States, but we we also are very interested in what's going on internationally. And so we'll be defining indigenous and we're looking at some inter international definitions of that. And then in the middle, we'll talk about ethics and philosophy and why that's so vitally important to ethnobotany and the what ethnobotany in the past has looked like and what ethics and philosophy actually means and why it's connected to ethnobotany or indigenous philosophy or knowledge in general. And moving from that, we'll, we like to finish off by leaving people some practical tools and some tips and then also how to use them. And Annie is gonna go ahead and define ethnobotany and biophilia, uh, especially biophilia. This is something she knows a lot about. Yeah, I ended up taking a horticulture class when I was in my master's program that kind of brought me to the idea of biophilia and to me, um, that made me recognize the importance, not only for indigenous people, but also for every human to reconnect to nature and to land in a completely different way. The quote that you see here is a quote from Keith Basso, and it's from a book called Wisdom Sits in Places. Um, this is a book that I have read many of times now. It's been a big part of my own healing and my own understanding of how important places are. I think Ledja and I have a unique opportunity where we had to move clear across the country um, to a brand new state, almost brand new plants, a whole different set of people. And we had to learn a whole different place. And with that place, it really kind of set this new idea and this new inspiration of self-reflection. And it made us realize how important places are to people. And not only that, but the memories that come with those places. I will always say I've lived in, oh my gosh, New York, Kansas, Hawaii, now Wyoming. My favorite place is forever the Mission Mountains. When I see those Mission Mountains, it is when I know that I'm home. And thinking of those places and how important it is to be a place-based person, you really do have to think about other people other times and whole networks that come within these places. And this next slide, it kind of continues on um, to incorporate about how this dynamic plays out. And the, the quote that, the end of the quote that I really like, he talks about when places are actively sensed, the physical landscape becomes weeded to the landscape of the mind, to the roving imagination and where the mind may lead as anybody's guess. And to me, that's so important because one worldview will look at a place completely different than another worldview will do. And throughout this presentation, you're gonna see just how different worldviews can be um, just by talking with Ledja and I. We very much have a different perspective on what is important in our own lives and how do we perceive that into the land and the landscape but it all comes back to places and how important places are to us. And we wanted to build upon the other definitions that the previous presenters have gave, but we wanted to really focus on the emphasis of place-based ethnobotany and really focusing on how important places are, especially when it comes to the ethno part of the body. Yes. And I really like Keith Basso's book, Wisdom Sits in Places in particular, because he's this is not this is not an indigenous guy, but he spent a lot of time in a very particular place with a very with a particular people learning from them and from the plants. And that then he wrote this book. And for what I gathered is he recognized something that we also recognize that places 
don't just hold stuff and they're not just points in time and space, but they actually hold knowledge there. And if you're able to go there and you look at it and you listen and you're patient, there's a lot that we can learn from places. And all it takes is time, really time, patience, and then the worldviews that Annie was hitting, uh, hinting at. It really does matter how, how you think and how you view something is going to have a large per impact on what data you gather and how you perceive and interpret that data. And so that in that way, it's all just so fascinating to me, the work that he's doing and has done it with this book is in particular. And the definition that of ethnobotany we like to use is right here. And it's very similar to some of the previous ones you've probably seen. And it's almost exactly what the United States Forest Service has on their website. But we really wanted to emphasize region and locality and also relationship. So a lot of the definitions we find don't really include lo locality or placeness, and they'll, but they will talk about relationships. And other times we find that they include this placeness, but they're not talking about relationships. And we feel like that's, you can't separate those two. That's a lot of what's going on when you spend time in a place is you're building a relationship between you and that place, between you and those plants. And so the one we like is that ethnobotany is the study of a region's relationship to plants and their practical uses through the traditional knowledge of local cultures and peoples. And before I go any further, I just pop in my head. If anybody has any questions, feel free to put it in the chat and we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end. We tried to make sure we save time for answering questions. And this is the, the United Nations definition of indigenous. And we thought it's important because it's tough to talk about what is indigenous knowledge if we're not on the same page as far as what is indigenous. And we really want to focus, especially on the first point, which is the self-identification as indigenous. And from my perspective, but I know Annie agrees with me a lot, a lot on this, a big part of it is responsibility. And if you don't accept those responsibilities, then inevitably, it's just not going to work. It doesn't have a lot longevity because when you didn't accept something and you didn't want it to begin with, then some point at in some time in the future, it's going to be a matter of you either going to have to reject or accept it. And if you never accepted it to begin with, then it's pretty tough to actually hold on to those responsibilities permanently. And it also talks about historical continuity, but again, very particularly talks about placeness. And we really like to talk about international indigenous definitions because we are very interested to see how differently indigenous peoples are situating themselves in the modern world because they have to deal with completely different legal systems, completely different economic systems than we have in the United States. And there in that second point, completely different histories. So the definition of indigenous can sometimes be very ambiguous and confusing, but we really like this one because it's simple, it's fairly politically neutral, and it's the one that the most influential institution of international politics uses that deals with indigenous people. There are other indigenous uh, organizations that deal with indigenous folks and, and are working with indigenous people, but this is by far the largest and the most influential. So we like to go with this, although we don't necessarily agree with everything in here, it's important to be aware of definitions. So we can all start from the same point. And the definitions of ethnobotany and indigenous we wanted to start there and then move into this idea of what is biophilia and the and how does that relate to locality, regionality, placeness, but also how does that relate to value systems and the philosophy of being indigenous? Yes, and we're going to use a lot of quotes, and I'm sorry about that, but there are a ton of people who have done a lot of study, and this has kind of been their focus, is really focusing on these ideas. So if we see some quotes, um, this one that we have here is from E.O. Wilson, and this was in the 80s, and he was the one that kind of popularized the idea of biophilia, 
biophilia was more talked about kind of in the 60s and then after the he started thinking of this and came out with his book called biophilia is when it really started to um, get more into the academic settings and when i first heard this word um the love of life or, or living systems to me seemed so natural that I really couldn't understand how anybody else didn't know that that was um, a thing that could happen until I started talking to people who lived in really urban cities and didn't have kind of the privilege that I had of living in a rural setting in Montana with the Mission Mountains as my background where they truly did have more of a modern upbringing where these psychological tendencies um, kind of lead to, um, oh, sorry, my cat is uh, going to be an issue. Um, tendencies um, that really prevent you from connecting to nature in a deeper capacity. And the quote that I like from E.O. Wilson, um, it, it really kind of talks about how we concentrate happily on ourselves and other organisms. And I find that very interesting um, when because when you think of the definition of traditional ecological knowledge that has been presented in previous um, webinars, it does talk about um, both living and non living things as being part of the worldview and how you should think about it in a deeper capacity as well. And so the book Biophilia, as it started to kind of change with time, it became an innate love for nature. And with this, it, it kind of showed that it's not a basic need for a cultural anemone, but it shows that it is for a universal primary need that you need to connect with nature, just as you need to do with healthy foods, regular exercise, all that needs to come together so you can have an ongoing connection to the natural world. And how do you do that exactly? How do you kind of connect yourself more into a deeper capacity to nature? It could be as easy as gardening, walking in the park, playing in the water, kayaking, watching birds, harvesting, um, visiting national parks and refuges, we live in a time that has put a lot of effort into making sure that public has natural resources and natural lands to be at. And there are potential to reconnect to that in any capacity. Um, it, the studies are a little bit different on how indoor plants work and we will be sure to link at the end of the presentation. We have a ton of resources and we can give a ton more resources that we have used um, throughout the years to help us. Uh, Lydia talks a lot about how important greenery is and like green spaces and how that affects your psychology and how it really does connect you in a deeper way and it helps improve your mental well-being, your spiritual well-being, your cultural well-being. Um, overall, it, it kind of gives you that improvement of your well-being. And this and forest bathing is a great example. I again heard this recently and it is very practiced in Japan. In Japan, they actually use it as preventative healthcare. And all you do is you just go out and you just sit in the forest. You engage with the forest and you're with the forest. And these results have shown that forest bathing improves your sleep quality, your mood, ability to focus, and stress levels. And then by spending time in nature away from modern technology and big cities, it can improve your physical and mental health by reducing those stress on your bodies. In my shirt, I'm going to give a little shout out to our merchandise that we had, which is a uh, BIMWA or being indigenous in the modern world. It's really finding ways of how do you interact with a lot of, yes, forest bathing, I see it in the comments. Um, it is such an important thing about how do you live in a world that is rapidly changing with technology. I know I spend all of my day on the computer, then at night I am on YouTube or I'm on my phone, I'm reading something. And how then do you connect back into culture when our modern technology is really pushing us towards the indoors? And this idea, 
really kind of came forward in this new program that Ledger and I went to in New York um, called the Sowing Synergy Cohort. Yes, and every time I hear you say that, I have a little giggle inside because I think it might be Sowing Synergy, oh, but sorry. maybe I'm totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yes, Annie, so the, Annie just went through a couple examples of how we view ethnobotany and biophilia and, and how they're combined. And ethnobotany, and just as a little bit of a caveat, I don't consider myself an ethnobotanist. And specifically because of that definition, uh, if anything, I'm maybe somebody that would work with an ethnobotanist, or maybe I'm a fledgling ethnobotanist, like a rookie, and I'm just now learning. Because really, especially if you consider what Rose Baradon Walk said about eth the ethno part of it being an ethnography, that's documenting a local culture or a, a people of a region. And then pairing that with botany seems very a very simple way to look at it. And I realized, okay, then um, I'm not doing that. That's not the kind of work I do. If anything, I teach, I'll take people out and just show them how to make a digging stick or show them how to make rope with, and where the right plants are at and how to actually look and see things in a certain way so you can find those things. And I realized I'm not an ethnobotanist, but I have very strong feelings on ethnobotany as a field especially the ethnobotanists that have worked in my community in the past. And this project, the Sewing Synergy project, really was a pivotal moment in my life. And I think for pretty much everyone that was a part of this program, it challenged us not to just look at things through an indigenous perspective, but to do it both, to try to see things from a Western scientific point of view, but also through our indigenous lens, how whatever that happened to be from where we were. And they encouraged us to do that and, and, to and to also combine different sciences, including social science and natural science. And through that, we had lots of conversations and we worked with a lot of different people there in New York, both indigenous, non-indigenous people from Europe, from all over the place. And we talked and talked and talked and pretty much just philosophized for days on end about these some of these topics you see here on the screen and this project was put together by a group of people over at the center for native peoples in, in the environment at the was it the college for environmental science and forestry which is a part of the big suny new york university system and it's a fairly small college in the scheme of things but they have some of the most amazing professors there and their natural science programs are some of the best in the country. So, and I didn't even know that till I got there. And sitting there talking about scientific ecological knowledge or SEK and talking, then talking about traditional ecological knowledge or TEK and talking about it with people that have been studying this stuff for 20, 30 years, I think was probably one of the biggest privileges I've ever had in my life. And it was really interesting to me because what we found was that we all, we're all pretty much after the same things. It's that we tend to see them slightly different. And in that way, we get different data sets. We get different information from the actual observations that we're making. And slowly we started to put together this that you see here. And all of these next couple, two, three slides are the product of many, many, many hours of us sitting me, Annie and I, us sitting with our cohort of other Native students, as well as a bunch of other Native, non-Native students, and also our professors, including folks like Robin Kimmer and Neil Patterson Jr., who are both some of the most qualified people to talk about either one of these subjects I've ever met in my life. And uh, for those of you not familiar with Robin Kimmerer, she works over there and she's special, a specialist in moss ecology. And she has one of the only classes in the nation that teaches ecology of mosses. And uh, her perspective on it is really interesting. And it, if I had no idea how amazing mosses were until I started to read some of her work on that. And the big takeaway that we were starting to get from all of these conversations about what are our lenses, what are our worldviews, and how does that affect indigenous science or how does that affect Western science? What is it, what kind of words do we want to use for these kinds of things? Is Western the correct term? 
Should we be using a different term? So a lot of these were questions we were figuring out with a, about a dozen other people. And we came out with what you see here, where we found that there are very distinct differences between these different these worldviews. And you can use indigenous, you can use native, you can use Western, you can use European. I kind of like the word modern, but each one of these words has problems with them. They have either some form of baggage attached to them or they just don't fit and completely describe what we're talking about. But really what we're hinting at here is there's different worldviews that people are using to interpret and gather data. And this is fairly well established in cultural anthropology that the difference between most uh, so sedentary city dwelling cultures and the and then the more ranging hunter gatherer cultures or indigenous cultures cultures the, the primary difference is in at the worldview level indigenous people view the land and the plants and other things as a series of kinship relationships or it's it's all a family Whereas the other worldview views it as a series of ownership relationships or that it's property or that the land can be owned, plants can be owned, things like that. And that really plays out in this list you see here where we're juxtaposing these two worldviews together. And I really wanna encourage people not to look at either one of these negatively because we need to talk together, we need to work together. and. Like I said earlier, science is one of the most powerful, amazing tools that humans have ever invented. And we should not just throw it out because it's caused a few problems and maybe more than a few problems. Um, and so here we're comparing them, the two worldviews where it's very individualistic and ownership based on the Western side and then very community and kinship based for indigenous communities and very reductionist compared to holistic and then linear time versus cyclical time, concentrating on short-term decision-making processes versus long-term decision-making processes. And the seven generation decisions varies depending on where you're at. It's not always the same way. It's not always interpreted the same way by all native people. The way I was taught is I'm the seventh generation. And I always, no matter what I'm doing, especially if it involves other people, I always need to consider what that's going to do to three generations in the future. And I always need to remember three generations in the past. And I'm the seventh generation and also the seventh direction. And um, that's very Picani stuff, but that's not Salish and that's not um, Crow necessarily, but we may share. It may be similar. I don't really know. Uh, I don't know enough about the uh, other folks and how they see stuff to speak on that. But the point I want to get at here is that there are some major themes, but there are definitely differences depending on what community you're looking at. So it's not like all Westerners are purely individualistic and focused on ownership, just like it's not like all indigenous people are purely communal and focused on kinship. We're looking at philosophy and worldview here and, and definitions and frameworks. And so that's really what this is hinting at. It's not like all indigenous people will practice all these different things and all Western folks will practice all these different things or that it's one or the other, but these are some of the major differentiating factors. And then again, some of them, some more of the differences and these are a little more nuanced explanations and a little more detailed, but I really like the very last point specifically talking about how there, there's this ongoing colonization and through the ownership and taking ownership of more and more things. Whereas I, I've heard this phrase of decolonization and I don't like that because it doesn't leave us with anything. We chose that, we will really prefer this phrase re-indigenize, not just because we're indigenous people and we think that we like our values or anything, but we do believe and this is a little controversial that we are all indigenous. We need to remember where we come from though. And that placeness is so important because we all have ancestors somewhere and everybody's ancestors, everybody's home, all those plants and all those animals, they, they all have something to teach us and we can't ignore that stuff. So 
I, I again, I want to encourage people not to look at the Western side as being negative and then the Indigenous side as being positive. It's not like that at all. It's really we're just trying to understand the differences so we can figure out how we're seeing things and what we're interpreting when we're interpreting it. And this is really the big, the big one. So there's the three R's that we were introduced to over in New York, and these are the responsibility, respect, and reciprocity, and how you need to come into a situation with respect. And a lot of people understand that fundamentally, but that again was something I was raised with. You don't ever go on the mountains or go berry picking or whatever it is if you don't understand respect. And I, every, my little boy mind always believed, oh, well, as long as I'm respectful, the bears won't get me. <laughs> and I, I learned that that's definitely not true, but there's something to that because when you are engaging in certain thinking patterns and you are adhering and actually accepting certain responsibilities and values, that is gonna change the way you act. It's gonna change the way you speak. It's gonna change the way you think. And so these three R's, the respect, respect, reciprocity, responsibility, were really important and were the three big concepts that came from that program in all those slides I just showed you. What we realized though, is that all three of these are really the end goal is to cultivate relationships to places and to plants. And even with people, I don't know any way to cultivate a, a strong relationship that's built on trust unless you have respect and, and you are living up to your responsibilities and you're, there's some kind of reciprocity. And I know every time I have failed on one of these things, even recently, it, it, it's just, it's not a good way to do relationships. And so that is where this brought us all is that most of the work we're work doing is to cultivate relationships with the land and with the plants in these places, but also heal the relationships that were already there. And that is really important, but also speaks to this worldview notion that we're hinting at, that there's differences between the worldviews, both philosophically and practically. And a lot of it comes down to how you relate to the plants. And so, the philosophy and ethics of ethnobotany and why it's so important to understand this particular part of it is because that's really what the the that's really what the difference is between the way I would go out and get berries versus just a just a regular botanist. And I've worked a lot with botanists. They crack me up, and I love how crazy they can be. I've noticed that they typically go and start handling plants right away. They don't go and take time. They don't look around and pay attention to stuff. And so, I'm, and I noticed the only reason I do that is because I was taught to do it that way. And they were taught to do it a different way. And that doesn't mean my way is better than their way or their way is better than my way, but we're getting different data. We're getting different information. Why not try to maximize our efforts? And so what I, what we, I realized, and I think a lot of us was that the approach is what's different. How, how we're priming ourselves in our mind and our hearts and how we approach the situation is really the big difference. And that does come down to ethical frameworks and philosophy. And I really, to, to paint this picture, I really like to use this diagram. It's from a, an ecologist named Fikret Berkis, and he published this paper in 2000 called uh, Rediscovery of Traditional Ecological Knowledge Through Adaptive Management or by Adaptive Management, something like that. But in this article, he brought he has this diagram and it's perfect because it has this big oval and it's just this is what a, your worldview and within your worldview and seeing the world and interpreting data and information, interpreting a scene, you have social institutions as well as within social institutions, nested land and resource management systems and all of that leads to local knowledge of land, animals, and of course, plants. And he specifically was talking about traditional or indigenous cultures and, and communities, but from, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this in the next slide with another article. I would argue that this is apl applicable to any culture, that all cultures have their social institutions nested within their dominant worldview. And that's gonna change 
depending on where you go regionally. And it might be very big regions or very small. And a, a good example I like to use is the Basque region in Northern Spain has a very unique worldview that has survived hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. And it's almost completely distinct from the other cultures and languages in Western Europe. And a lot of that comes down from the worldview perspective. It's the like the biggest, most macro, uh, big picture way we can look at some of these knowledge systems. And this is another article published out of Belgium by an author named Vidal. And they were, they did a historical analysis on what is a worldview because the definition of a worldview is, has been so ambiguous and vague for such a long time. The work really wasn't being done. And, and then in 2008, Vidal did an analysis looking at historical literature as well as other philosophical texts and came to the conclusion that a worldview can be summarized in, the, in being the answers to these six questions you have here. And don't worry about the specifics of these questions or what ontology or axiology like really means. These ologies can be, I mean, I still struggle with these things. The main thing though is in this paper also, Vidal was arguing that really the first three are answered by modern science. The last three, modern science isn't that good at answering those. And so what do we do? Again, what do we do? Which questions is modern science good at answering and which ones is indigenous science good at answering? And the, the important point here is that the, the, there's different worldviews and not one of them is going to deliver all of the answers. Modern science cannot give us all the answers like about value systems and how we're supposed to go about doing what we do. And that is a part of the way indigenous people view science and how we've always viewed it. And again, that's not that one or the other is better. It's that they offer different results. And if we want as many results and as much information to be able to make decisions from as we can get, we should be looking at as many worldviews as we can. And it's also very interesting because when you start to look at things like intellectual property rights and how you can own ideas and own knowledge, that is one of the main tools that people are using to either protect themselves or maybe even oppress and take knowledge from people. And so with that being said, I want to turn it over to Annie and she can talk a little more about intellectual property rights and why it's so important to to look at that this is looking at things as ownership, not um, kinship. Yeah, and the reason why I talk about this is because when I was figuring out my research project and one of the things that I had to do is I had to present to tribal council, um, the Confederate Salish and Kootenai Tribal Council and I had never done that before. Um, I thought that I had this great idea um, working with plants. I was very excited. I was really kind of naive coming into the situation. Again, I my relationship with plants started later in my life. And it wasn't until I was um, in front of tribal council and they asked me about intellectual property rights that I really realized that I have to dig deeper into the ethics and the philosophy that comes with learning about traditional ecological knowledge and especially learning about plants. And there are many instances, um, there are two kind of um, types of intellectual property protections that are being sought right now. So the defensive protection, which aims to stop people outside the community from acquiring intellectual property rights over traditional knowledge, um, like Lydia had said, we focus a lot, not only in the United States, but really learning about what other indigenous people are doing. And so this example is actually from India um, and they have compiled a searchable database of traditional medicine um, that can be used um, as evidence of prior art by patent examiners uh, when assessing patent applications. And so a lot of this information that has been used by indigenous communities for so long are now being sought out by particularly pharmaceutical companies 
in the hopes of kind of the medicinal fields and helping that. But to what capacity then are you taking away the plants that have been used in that area and have adapted and evolved with the people? And one thing that we, me and Ledja have talked about, and I'm surprised we didn't put it in this slide, um, is, is that not only do plants change people, but people change plants as well. And there is a large portion of plants, and especially one example that I learned um, in Syracuse in particular was how sweetgrass needs to be tended so so many times um, or it will disappear. It's one of those plants that really needs to be touched and needs to be harvested and it needs to be interacted with people. Uh, bitterroot is another one that is highly disturbed that really likes to have that disturbance with it. And so when you're taking away these um, ideas and these intellectual property rights of indigenous people, you're taking away a lot of their plant knowledge and you're not allowing them to access plants in a certain way. Then the second one that's being sought is this idea of positive protection, which is granting of uh, rights that empower communities to promote their traditional knowledge. Um, and some of these I mean, there's a number of countries that have developed their own specific legislation that kind of goes over this, but they're, um, it, it's kind of very much based on um, government and international legal instruments, which is very political. And so then how do you really take this political thing such as intellectual property rights and talk to a tribal council about that? And it is very difficult. It is one of those where you need to realize, um, I know I get a lot, I deal with a lot of environmental education when it comes to non-Indigenous um, teachers and also non-Indigenous people that just wanna kind of learn. And appropriation is one of the largest um, comments that people ask me is how do I make sure that I'm not appropriating um, the cultural knowledge that is there? And I will always, always, always suggest, it was so nice, I even saw somebody in the comment um, that gave um, a great example of, they even mentioned their own um, land acknowledgement in the chat. And, and I know Jennifer had done that in the beginning, um, where really kind of promoting that idea of including these new ideas into life without appropriating them. And you should always go and talk to the local community where you're at. If you're doing land acknowledgements, go and talk to that community, go talk to that tribal council, because this next slide that we're gonna talk about um, really kind of was a limitation that came with Leja's and mine's research presentation that we did and how it really affected our master's program when both of us really thought that we were doing the right thing and we had done all this stuff and it very much ended up being um, a two-year process of trying to get the right idea and the right um, project that the tribe wanted and it was all because of the intellectual property rights being abused and not being honest with the indigenous people that they were getting this information from. So. I'm not sure how many people are familiar with this book and I have a very mixed relationship with this book in particular, but this book is, um, and particularly the, the research that Jeff Hart did for his, for his uh, what was his PhD, but he was working at the University of Montana for a long time. And he's an uh, anthropologist, he did a lot of ethnographies, and then he wrote this book. And although he does, in the beginning, he uses the last part of a, the paragraph in the introduction to say that there's a certain way to do this. There's a certain value system, there's like a certain way to collect. Um, but aside from that, what this book inevitably led to, whether his intentions were good or not, was some areas being completely overrun and outpicked. And now the, some places don't have berry patches anymore that some families have been taking care of for generations. And other places uh, are just never going to recover. And 
a lot of people were very upset because it's not just that they couldn't go pick berries anymore. That was their responsibility. That was their, that was their responsibility for their family to take care of that place and to see it get destroyed because people went out using this book and this knowledge and went and started picking and they picked way too much in some cases, but in some cases, I'm sure people did it just the right way. And that's the real danger with not giving this knowledge with the ethics and the philosophy with those ethical frameworks so because it's so vitally important to conduct yourself in a certain way because you're going to again see different things and you're going to interpret the data you're gathering differently and so did you want to add anything to that annie well i made it a goal of mine uh to not do what jeff hart did in my research it was the driving force of why um I will never present my research in public. Uh, my research will not be published. All of my research is going to the Salish Culture Committee. I have spent hours talking just with Tony Gashola, who is the, the Salish Pandare Culture Committee Director um, on how do I create a better research project where the elders don't feel like the knowledge is being exploited. And to me, that was really important that I had people supporting me. And, and the only reason why I think I was so successful in my master's program, as Lija has mentioned, uh, having Robin and having Neil there to support you, to have the same kind of understanding about how to move forward uh, with very academic settings um, and IRBs and, and all of these new things that I had never, internal review boards, if anybody doesn't know what an IRB is, um, and making sure that your knowledge is, is kind of kept. And I really, really fought to make sure that not only was it tribal members, but it was also descendants that was learning. Um, about half of my nieces and nephews are not uh, tribal members, but they are descendants. And to me, it's so important because um, like Ledja had mentioned, I feel like we are all indigenous to some place and it's important for us to make sure that we keep that connection alive. Um, and I do a bad job because I'm also a quarter Welsh. And so I am kind of slowly learning about Wales and I would love to go to Wales eventually because they have such a unique indigenous history there as well. And so really focusing on this idea of reaching out to the proper people um, so that you aren't doing what this guy did. And, and now I've tried to reach out to him and, and kind of get, maybe if he had any transcripts of it because the book itself, I know we've talked, me and Ledja off topic had talked about it, about how do we feel about um, kind of sharing this information in kind of the book now, now that we know the full history of this book and how do we move forward? And it's so hard because a lot of our elders now are so, shall, are so keep that information to themselves and they're scared to kind of share that information out. And it's so important to make sure that we aren't doing that in the future. There are opportunities to learn about that. And it's why it's so important to me to make sure that non-Indigenous people know Indigenous values like respect, responsibility, and reciprocity with every aspect of all their relationships that they have. And that's really kind of just what I wanted to say about this book and just how, um, there is great field guides out there and there's great information and yes i do see tim tim is my uncle and um me and Ledger actually have a great connection with tim and was tim here no but i saw amy williams hi amy. Oh, okay <laughs> um i saw that she just commented that um and so to me it's so important to make sure that you understand that the resources that you may be looking at, especially if they deal with native plants and especially if it's medicinal plants, make sure that you have the right um, kind of context and the right person there talking to you about it. And never hesitate to reach out to somebody in your local area, never hesitate to reach out to local indigenous communities. Being in New York, I realized I was really scared kind of reaching out, especially with Haudenosaunee, um, there are six nations there, and um, to me, it was such a eye-opening experience to feel how accepted they were when I reached out, and now I became um, my own gardener because of them. I got to work with a lot of farming crew. I got to see how 
can you interact with plants in a completely different way? And to me, it wouldn't have happened if I wouldn't have reached out to them. So never hesitate to reach out and ask questions and see and see if people can teach you and, and what is that tribe willing to explain and teach to you um, or your teach or your school brings people in. I work in um, the fish and wildlife field and that is my goal is to try to get other local indigenous community members to come in and teach these. Because while I am a Salish person, I am not going to be a tribal member from here in Wyoming. And is in, it is important to make sure that you have that person there that is going to explain that to you if you are confused, if you're unsure about how to move forward. Yeah, and I think, I've heard this saying over the years, there's, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Well, I completely disagree with that. There is 100% such thing as a dumb question. It's the ones that people don't ask. So yes. I truly believe that. And the worst thing that can happen is you get rejected and someone says no. Or maybe even if they're insulting, it's really a learning experience for everybody, including them, because maybe they shouldn't act like that about that. But anyways, yeah, we, we, we don't like to be negative. We don't like to point at people and say, look what they did. How, how bad is that? But this book is so important. It needs to be talked about more. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, <laughs> to bring up some My more practical part. tools <laughs> and resources and how to use these, because had that book had a better introduction or had he been more explicit with the elders that he was working with, this we would probably wouldn't even be talking about this. Yeah, and this is my favorite part. So one of the things that I got out of my research and kind of moving forward with um, the culture committee on how do I properly and how do I holistically kind of start tribal members off and descendants if they've never worked with plants before or never harvested and kind of moving forward. And the first thing that Tony told me was teach them how to identify plants. Just start off simple and then slowly build your way up after you could identify them. And then the final goal is to then, how do you harvest? What are the traditional uses? That way you can understand how do you collect? How do you go? What areas? Um, we focus a lot on understanding holistic meanings. And so that means secular cycles, seasonal rounds, everything is connected. And so understanding how that plant is mutually beneficial in that ecosystem is so important. And don't, don't panic, it's not gonna be like a in-depth plant ID um, demonstration. It's just gonna be the basics. But for me, it's so important because um, like this quote says, learning a new plant is like forming a lifelong relationship. And it very much is, I can say that moving to a completely different area, when I saw some Douglas fir, some ponderosa pine, and then I saw some yarrow and it was truly eye-opening for me to see that the basic plant ID really connected to me to home and how no matter where you go, if you can recognize the plants and if you can communicate with those plants, you really do have a better sense of well-being of yourself when you are in that area, especially if you're by yourself like I am here in Wyoming um, and connecting with those plants truly is um, something amazing. And even just from a practical, pragmatic point of view, if you're not familiar with how to identify plants and you're in a bad situation, say a survival situation, um, this is something I find myself in a lot because I do research in very remote settings and I do work, other work in remote settings. And so I was always interested in it. But um, yeah, if you get stuck in another country, not knowing the plants is definitely going to hurt you. So it's really important. And like Annie said, these are really basic tips that you can take with you anywhere you go. Yes. And the first one is kind of definitely learning what a monocot and the dicot is. It's starting off very basic. We're not going to go too far into it. Um, just know that a monocot is going to have some parallel veins. It will have a single seed leaf. Um, that emerges from the seed. So when it is coming out of the ground or sometimes even in the ground, um, these are typically gonna be your grasses. But again, plants like to make us fools and they will come <laughs> in and out however they please. And then dicots will have more perpendicular and intersecting veins uh, where they will have two seed leaves that emerge from the seed, um, typically like you're a bean or a pea. Yeah. 
And then you got to count the petals, which of course only works if they have flowers. So this will only work during uh, flowering seasons, which tends to be my favorite time to kind of take people out on plant walks because it is a little bit harder to identify plants if they don't have any key characteristics. I try to do with grasses and boy, it kicked my butt. So making sure that you kind of start your journey in the spring and I think everything is in renewal. Everything is kind of coming out of winter and spring and it's a great time for you to get out there and like kind of do your own plant walks, maybe start doing identification in your yards. Uh, going to your closest natural, um, your um, like state park, refuge, national park, kind of going into these hiking trails as well and seeing how many plants you can identify. And then this will help you with the plants you can't identify. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these pair together really nicely. And especially if you're <laughs> out when they're, they have flowers, you'll be able to see the flowers and the leaves next to each other. Yep. So say they, it's out of season and you can't see the flowers, you can st start being able to tell by the leaves, especially once you spend a lot of time there. And if it's a particular place, you can be guaranteed you're going to know where certain plants are if you spend enough time yes. there. Yes, exactly. And oh, just back up one, just, just real quick. Um, so monocots will have uh, petals that are sets in multiples of three. So Camus here has flower petals of six. So that is a multiple of three. And then the wild rose over here is a dicot and they tend to have flowers with petals in sets of four or five. And it's always good to remember that if you see the petals that have four or five or three or six, that's how they're all gonna have. So you won't have a random one that's gonna have five and then 10 and then seven. They generally will keep this plant, um, the petal structure as well. Okay, sorry, I just wanted to quickly add that. No, that's a good point. Okay, then moving on to the leaves, um, this tends to be pretty important if they don't have the flower, the flowers and the petals. Um, and it is going to be at the very end, we'll show you a dichotomous key, which is a little bit harder to understand, but it will be a question that will be asked. And so this idea of opposite branching is that leaves, branches, and buds will all emerge off the stalk in sets of two, and they will be immediately opposite of each other versus the alternate branching, which the leaves and branches that emerge off the stem are one by one in alternate directions. Then there's two more, um, the world uh, branching, definitely, oh, they're making dichotomous keys in first, fourth grade. So we should have done a little in-depth one. Um, ah, yeah, and I know some people are exposed to them pretty young. I didn't learn about it until I got to college. I didn't either. So good job for you for teaching your. Yeah, partner. that's cool. I am super impressed. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I wish yeah. I learned that in fourth grade. I do too. That's awesome. Well, and then that was a long time ago when I was teaching fourth grade, and so, um, but but they still they still got it, and they actually the kids who loved puzzles really liked putting those. Hmm. I was big into the word finds and I love um, dichotomous keys now. And I love my field guides. Um, I have a manual of all the Montana vascular plants that is in depth. And you very much have to know a lot of plant ID in order to get down there, especially when you start dealing with the aster families that we have here. Oh, it is, uh, it is pretty crazy um, how in depth yeah. these get, but we just wanted to give you the basic idea of how do you then go outside and kind of help yourself build a deeper connection to plants. And, and yeah, world, simple, simple ways yeah. to identify. It's just very simple. Oh, oh yeah, see seventh grade. Um, and so uh, world branching is leaves and branches that emerge off the stem and branches that are completely a circle within the whole stalk. And then basal branching is there is no, um, there's no main stem and all the leaves and the flower heads emerge directly from the base. And a great idea is a dandelion or thistles, I mean, either one. Mm -hmm. Um, this one, I mean, we're going to be very simple because you can get into a lot of leaf types, leaf arrangements, yes. margins, it gets pretty complicating, but if you can understand simple versus compound, it will really help you a lot when you get to your field guide book to look for this plant. And so simple yeah. is just, no. Yeah, I was just saying, yeah, 
<laughs> Go for it. Get it. Get it. Yeah. Um, simple is a single undivided leaf versus compound, which is a leaf divided into multiple leaflets that are attached to the stem. Within the compound, it is kind of generally split up into two, but again, uh, some will blow you out and, and there's bipinnately that we'll talk about, but uh, pinnately compound, which is feather-like arrangement on leaflets from the mid vein. And then there's palmately compound, which I always tell people is like your palm. And then um, the leaflets will radiate from a single point within that. So a maple leaf is a great example of, of kind of the palmately compounded leaf. Um, the next one, which will be our last kind of identifying point for you, um, is just united versus uh, separate flowers. Um, and that, so one is that the petals are all connected at the base, like the shooting star that we have here to the left. And then for separate, the petals are attached to the plant individually, and you can pull them off individual, um, individual petal without it um, affecting noticeably the flower. Um, kind of like the wild geranium that we have on the right. And this is the dichotomous key that we decided just to, and really the whole point is we just wanted to show everyone how you can move through the key. It's not really about what's being said or we're not going to be identifying anything, but as, if you know how to move through the one key, you can move through any dichotomous key. And like Annie said, especially once you get into certain families of plants, some of the terms and all the different specialty words that start going with identifying get really crazy. So the only way I know how to teach anybody that is to just give them one of those big thick books and send them out and let them key plants and identify stuff um, with the right guidance. And really that's the thing I've noticed that stopped me and other students of mine was when you get stuck in the key somewhere. And then you want to just give up because you're like two pages in. <laughs> and so the basics of it is you start with the very beginning, number one, always. And you look at, it's really a series of questions, even though they're not phrased as questions often. You're looking at, does this have, does this, uh, is, uh, are these needle leaves or are they non-needle leaves? And that would be the question you ask yourself. If they are needle leaves, then it says go to two. And so in that case, you'd ignore B and you go directly to point two and then you'd answer that question which is the juxtaposition of are these needles in clusters or are they single needles and depending on the answer to that question you will then get okay this is a pine or it's a spruce but say for example on the first one it didn't have needle leaves it had the big flat chunky leaves instead so in that case Point B on number one, you would then follow over across and just follow the instructions really more than anything. And it, but the problem is, is in guides, it doesn't always say go to the number, but it will always be laid out and structured the same way. So you'll see the things on the left hand side, on the left hand side that will be going, uh, being the description and like the question, it's the dichotomy that they're presenting you with. And then on the right side of the page or the sheet will be the directions for where you need to go, depending on the answer to that question, to that dichotomy. So for the first point, say they're big fat non-needle leaves, then we go to number three and skip past two. And then on that one, say it had the compound leaves or the, the ones that had the different things that they weren't simple, but they had different parts. Say they're compound, so we'd skip past four, five, and six and then go all the way down to seven. And so with the dichotomous key, it presents you with these a choice. And depending on the choice you make, you it brings you to another part of the key. And it always tells you what part to go in on that right-hand side. And then the comparison or the question you got, got to answer to figure out where to go is always on the left-hand side. Is there anything I'm missing there? Nope. Yeah. Got it. And like Annie said, dichotomous key. When I first heard that phrase, I was like, what? I didn't really get it even when I saw them and I was trying to use them. I didn't really get it right away. Um, maybe that's just me, but everybody has their own experience with these things. I've seen some people pick it up right away and able to identify species, no problem. And I've seen other people, it takes them a few goes before they figure out, oh, oh, so it's like, it's kind of like a map or like a table of contents. 
it is. And now for my favorite part, um, I know we have about four or five minutes left, so I'm going to try to scoot through this pretty fast. Um, so I just kind of wanted to quickly touch base on um, what is a native plant. So just quickly, it's a plants that occur naturally in a particular area, uh, plant species living, especially where we are in North America continent before European settlement. And then they're also adapted to local conditions, which means like rainfall amount, hardiness, and soil type. And then it's really good to understand the difference between native landscapes and conventional landscapes. Again, uh, me and Ledger talked for many hours about the idea of native landscapes. Um, again, wordage, uh, we're just kind of going to go with it for now. But native landscapes tend to rely, um, relies on the plants that lived in a region for thousands of years, and they're well adapted to the local growing conditions. Um, they are pretty difficult to mass produce and to distribute across the country as well. And for me, native plants create a sense of place. With conventional landscapes, um, it's a lot of what you're going to see around large buildings, around Walmarts, you're going to have grass, um, tough surfaces, um, hedges, uh, lawn grass, ornamental grasses. Uh, these plants are usually easy for nurseries and stores to mass produce and distribute, um, but it does create a monoculture, so there is very low genetic or biological diversity that comes with uh, monocultures and they very simplify the landscapes and it's a heavy reliance on lawn or turf which is a heavy reliance on a use of water. And so the benefits of having native plants itself are they're less resources less resource intensive, they're less costly, they're um, less time intensive as well. You don't need regular mowing or watering. The long roots eliminate the need for watering during the summer. Um, summer droughts, especially in Montana, where we are, we deal a lot with drought, especially in August, uh, with a lot of our fires come there. So it's important to make sure that we have some drought resistant plants. And then you also don't need synthetic, synthetic fertilizers or pesticides. And then the pos positive ecological impacts are that native plants support native insects, which support birds and other wildlife. And then most insects are specialists and they have a specific relationship with the host. And the favorite one that I use, like to use is milkweed and monarchs because monarch larva only will go to milkweed plants. And so it very is a specialized relationship that they have. And in Montana, there are seven native uh, milkweed species. So we do have a wide variety that we can use and it is important to remember that. Um, it also has great carbon storage and increased stormwater infiltration. I'm just quickly gonna touch base on uh, compacted soils because I get to talk about rain gardens next. And to me, that is extremely important to know what compacted soils are. Um, they do act like a barrier which can reduce and prevent um, the precipitation that comes into the ground. And this creates surface runoff, uh, which does increase flooding and, and being in the area where we want to make sure that we are absorbing and having all the water that we can, especially in those, in those summer months where we are in those drought conditions. It is important that we're making sure that our soils are good and we have the same plants there that can contain and hold a, a large amount of water when we get the rain. So how does a rain garden work? Um, the Nature and Conservancy really kind of did this um, better than I could have done. So I'm pretty sure um, if you want to know more about it, you can go to the Nature Conservancy. But a rain garden, um, they are shallow landscape depressions that capture, clean, and absorb stormwater runoff from roofs parking lots and roads. So rain gardens really are ideal for more urban settings or more settings that are in town settings as well. Um, the purpose of it is, is that the middle, as you can see, um, the waters absorb into the garden like a sponge. And when it enters the ground, um, it can help the stormwater runoff and it will keep in one area. And by doing this and by planting more native species, it does help um, the pollutants and it does not require added fertilization as well. And so also the native plants. I'm a big pollinator. So if any time that I can save some butterflies, I will be saving some butterflies. And I, as I become older, I am loving bird watching as well. 
And so it very is it is important for us to make sure that our lawns or where we're living is conducive and it is okay for animals and insects to come into that yard and we're not wasting time and wasting water and resources. Uh, when we can have something like this that really focuses on saving water and filtrating it itself in a natural system. Mm. Yeah, and this is, a, this is one of those simple, really easy to do type of projects where, and, and it looks like all these are native species that I'm familiar with even. And the, that's really important to us because we, we recognize not everybody has time to do all this different stuff or even to go out in the woods all the time. But to bring these native plants into our backyards and begin cultivating that relationship there, I think that's awesome. And that's something that I wanna encourage more people to do as much as possible, especially berry bushes. I'd love to see berry bushes in everybody's yards. Uh, it's just gotta be careful for the bears, uh, but that's a whole nother can of worms. I think if you go to the next one, yeah. So these have a little bit of berries. This was done in Washington, but it does give you a great example of how can you use um, native plants into your landscape, into a house setting. And there's some birds and it's such beautiful ideas. I suggest looking more into rain gardens if it's something you can do. If you can't, the next slide, I'm gonna try to go really fast. Mm -hmm. um, talks about uh, gardening for pollinators. And for me, pollinator gardens are so important. And if you wanna know more about pollinator gardens, um, the Forest Service and also Fish and Wildlife Service has great materials on how to start your own pollinator garden. And they even have it based on the area that you're in, in the country. So it is, they can really define it to the area that you're in. These are just some simple steps to kind of create a friendly pollinator garden in your own area. That's what I'll be doing this summer is creating a pollinator garden here um, into my new area. And then my research actually focuses a lot on the idea of forest gardening. And to me, forest gardening is so important because living in Montana and especially Western Montana, where you we have the Mission Mountains and we have such a great area that is conserved with the Mission Mountain Wilderness area, it is important for us to understand how do you also live in the mountains as well. You wanna click on the next slide. And so the reason why I'm so in love with forest gardens is because there are seven layers to what a forest garden is. There's a canopy, a sub canopy, shrubs, um, uh, uh, herbaceous plants, you have the rhyosphere, you have soil cover, then you have your climbers. And all of those together work in natural and in unison to move forward and be mutual beneficial for each other. And you really can have an ecosystem where every layer is covered. And if you wanna do more about pollinator or forest gardens, let me know, I will talk about it all day. And this next one just quickly is talking about a dandelion salve. Um, I know people are interested in how to make your own plants and dandelions are one of the most frequent plants that we see, especially in Western Montana. Um, and so here's just a quick idea of what you can do with a salve. And these salves I use for um, sore muscles. And so what you just use is can about um, dry dandelions, uh, twice as much as your favorite carrier oil. I really like hemp oil. Um, and then I put it in my cabinet for four to six weeks and I shake it when I remember. It's very easy and that's how you can create your, um, your own infused oil. And then you do this process and then you can make your own dandelion salve as well. And these are a few resources that we wanted to include um, to make sure that you can move forward and kind of get your own experience with these. Some are field guides. Uh, Montana Grasses is a great app if you want to learn about grasses in your area. I have to learn a lot about that because grasses is hard to do. Um, the wildflowers one of Montana, I haven't used yet, but if you're looking for a cultural resource, especially on the Flathead Reservation, I do suggest that you check out the animal field guide to the Flathead Reservation, riparian species. While it does only focus on mammals, birds, um, and amphibians, I believe, they are working to get it more inclusive with plants as well. And they have Salish and Kootenai names and how to say it as well. It is such a great resource, especially on the Flathead area. Yes, and uh, down at the bottom, there's this podcast we love called Crime Pays But Botany Doesn't. 
And it's this really irreverent Chicago Italian guy that sounds just like Mickey Santoro from what's that the casino mover, maybe it was Goodfellas. But he's a, an amazing taxonomist and a systematics. His knowledge of systematics and how plants have evolved is just mind blowing. And to know that he know, he know, he dropped out of college. And uh, so that uh, it's so inspiring to me that people can gain that high level knowledge without ever going to a college class because he was dedicated and he spends a lot of time. And he's from my perspective, he's becoming indigenous to that place to the the little side streets of Chicago where he plants and takes care of these trees for like 15 years okay. and and then goes back and checks on them and ta he talks to them and stuff and um, but it's funny because the way he talks is just uh, it's very entertaining but he, his knowledge is really high level and he he's he even has some videos of eastern Montana so mm -hmm. folks over there you can watch some of his videos and find out all sorts of stuff about plant systematics and plant evolution specific to some of those high plains species. And then also gathering moss is up there in the corner. We recognize a lot of people are aware of braiding sweetgrass from Robin Kimmerer, which is a great book. And I recommend it. And I really like it in that you can go to a chapter and read the chapter and it stands on its own. Where the reason I really like gathering moss though, is it's a whole, it's like a story that plays out throughout the book. But similarly, you can go to a chapter and each one has its own story. But it blew my mind because I had no idea just how diverse mosses are. But also, I've used mosses my whole life for all sorts of stuff, mostly survival oriented. But when I found out that you can drink water out of them, and it's totally fine because they have naturally occurring iodine in their cells, I thought, holy crap, how do plants do that? I just, again, Gathering Mosses is one of those few books that can teach you how crazy plants really get. Mm -hmm. And then these are all, not all of them, but some of the ones we thought were more important to recommend as far as references and uh, the resources we were using. And we have a pretty large list of books there with Robin's book there in the bottom. But the, there's other books we didn't mention in there as well. And we highly encourage people to read these as much as possible. And there's some websites. And we do have a ethnobotany episode for our podcast. If you're interested in listening to that, it is this. Whoops. It's the it's one of those links in the websites. It's the very bottom link on the websites list. But we like we like to encourage people to look at all this stuff. And we just ramble and have conversations, but they're very informed and structured in, in our own kind of way. So if anybody wants to hear more of our opinions on ethnobotany, you can go check out that episode number two of the Indian Science Show. They're fantastic. And I do have that link um, on the resources and I'll make sure to put these resources from, uh, from you all as well and, and add them to the resource sheet. But I, I try, I got a few, a few of them going. Um, thank you. Yes, I um, don't see any. Uh, I'm I am not monitoring the chat, so please do make sure that you put the uh, questions in Q and A. Otherwise, there's too many things. But um, there is a couple things that I I did want to first of all just acknowledge. Um, you know, really putting the context um, into what why this is important and and why worldviews are important and and why. Um, you know, coming at it from from the cultural side and uh, as an informed, you know, uh, person, as you think about, you know, what are the differences or why should why can't I teach this or what should I teach? And I think that's, you know, those are those are areas of um, teaching that, you know, can be really kind of intimidating to teachers. So I think the more background knowledge we can build on, you know, what what it all means to um, to have cultural appropriation, to have respect, to have um, you know, relationship, the four R's and the values. Um, I just think that's tremendously important. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. And then I have to say, um, in my own experience, you know, I never gardened before uh, this year, really. And when I moved into this new place, there was a junkyard behind me, a quarter acre junkyard. And I got it all cleaned out because last year on New Year's Day, it was 54 degrees and I couldn't sit inside on a 54 degree day. So I started cleaning it. 
And one of the most magical things that has ever happened is I was gifted, and they probably weren't all native, but um, it was a, a box of, of 10,000 wildflower seeds from the taller store. And I planted three boxes of them, so 30,000 seeds. And I got this huge island. And I will never forget the one I, you know, I was out there every single morning. The first morning I saw my, my first bee and that bee came right up to me. And I, all I can say is I just got this tremendous sense of gratitude. And now this year I have many more native seeds and um, we'll be planting those to, to attract even more. But the other thing was I also had 52 species of bird come through my yard. Nice. So many of them I left. I didn't mow at the end of the year. I didn't clean up any of the yard waste. I didn't cut anything down. And I noticed well into November goldfinches and chickadees and sparrows using all of the sunflowers and all of the seed heads. And so I'm a total convert to um, to producing uh, more habitat for our small wildlife. Um, so I think that's mm -hmm. just I was glad to see all those gardenings and I could talk to you about gardening all day and we probably will do that soon. Um, yes. Anyhow, uh, also a Tim, Tim, your uncle was in, invited and he was busy teaching tonight. So he definitely wanted to see the, the recording. Mm -hmm. But um, let's see, I think we do maybe have some questions now. Um, oh, wow. I just saw uh, there's a comment from Brian Radcliffe. What? Cool, man. Yeah. I'm glad to, glad you made it, man. It's oh, been a long morning. time. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So in, in two minutes or less, um, what is one plant particularly that speaks to you? Yarrow. You can go real quick. Fire, rapid fire. Subalpine fir. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, that's yarrow. mine. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's my favorite plant. Answer. Easy answer. Yeah, it's my favorite plant. Yep, yarrow. I love yarrow. Yarrow is pretty awesome too. <laughs> and if you mix them, you got a perfect band-aid. There you go. You do. See, we we come together in a two worlds. One is a tree, yeah. and one is a flower. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, I guess technically they are angiosperms. Yeah. True. So subalpine. Yeah. <laughs> I love hmm. it. Uh, I did see one that the uh, I didn't I can't find it again, but somebody asked about an example of the um, positive intellectual rights, uh, property rights. I'm trying to find that again, but I, I don't know if I phrased that right. Well, property rights. Um, so if we're talking about the positive ones, I think what they were talking about is Yes, how... positive protection, positive protection for intellectual property. Yeah. So she was asking for a, an example. Um, thank you for the question, Mary. Yep. So creating your own specific legislation that protects this knowledge in local communities would be a positive um, yeah. intellectual property right is making sure that there's legislation that supports what indigenous and local communities want to do moving forward with their own um, specific traditional ecological knowledge, in particular with plants. Uh, property rights get really weird when you're talking about patents and, uh, and more pharmaceutical, uh, but it's making sure that they are supported moving forward with legislation. Yeah. Quick answer. Well, thank you both so, so much. I learned so much. I, I, I just, I am absorbing everything and I get to be so lucky because I caption these the next day. So I get to listen to it all over again. But um, I just thank you both. Everyone, um, please, if you're still at school, have a safe travels home. I see it's gotten super duper cold outside and it's been snowing outside my window. So safe travels home. I wish you all a very healthy um, January and we'll see you back here in February when we have <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yeah, it was thank so you. Much fun. <laughs> yes, it was a pleasure. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your evening. And the feedback survey is open. Make sure to do it. Oh, I see Moss is here. Hi, Moss. We love Moss. Hi, Rose. I don't know if that's you, but we love you. Hi. <laughs> okay, bye. That's okay. it. <laughs> <laughs>